One of the things about uh, your Schumpeterian approach that's attracting many people is they see an analog to what is called Nydian uncertainty, that <clears throat> in financial markets people say, well, you can't see the future, There's, things are not structurally stable, uh, markets are not inherently stable in the statistical sense. So you are out there interacting with, uh, how do you say, in the fog without a chart. With regard to technical innovation, we're in a place where the price system in the goods and the real market is, is also subject to that kind of structural uncertainty by its very nature. The dynamism of technical change is reorienting Absolutely. the economy. So it seems now that there's a convergence between those people who would study like Soros reflexivity or Hyman Minsky on the financial front the people who are looking at the uncertainty and the dynamism in, the, in technical change. And are you seeing research converging between uh, those who study finance and those who study uh, technical? Well, uh, few. I mean, my, my group does that, but uh, okay. very few do that. Uh, yeah. But this is a fundamental point, recognizing that for different reasons. But you have got uh, a, a fundamental night and uncertainty in both markets. Uh, then uh, this is uh, the next question is, uh, but then what drives, uh, for example, investment in innovation if people cannot have rational technological expectation? Well, above a certain level of appropriability of innovation, of the return from innovation, I think that uh, are the inherent, opp inherent opportuni in, uh, opportunity associated with each technology that essentially determine uh, how much people search uh, in that technology, quite independently from the fine-tuning of, uh, of the return associated with that. And, um, uh, a, good, uh, a good case to the point is uh, the quasi-natural experiment associated with the tightening, tightening of the legislation, the legislation and the practice of IPR in this country, mm -hmm. uh, say in the last 20, 30, 30 years. Um, as it produced, well, this of course has increased the rent of the innovators. Uh, as it increased the rate of innovation, now, it has increased the rate of patenting, but are bad patents. Mm -hmm. uh, there are, when uh, my friend Sid, uh, Sid Winter looked at it, there were, uh, if I remember well, 30 or 40 patents on how to exercise your cat. <laughs> Probably <laughs> now there are 100. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, these are the, the irrelevant ones, but uh, uh, the, the net result has been that uh, it has been a sort of arm race in terms of litigation. Uh, and the latest estimates are, are that uh, the litigation cost of the U.S. industry is one third of R&D. Oh man, that's an amazing. That's an empiric, <laughs> this I would say, stylized fact this is of the first exactly. order. Yeah, that's stunning. That is the uh, uh, American patent lawyer get more than the total R&D budget of Germany. Wow, and I'm I'm hearing people fighting now at one level the traditional notion of the patent to secure property rights to create the inspiration for the investment. But I'm hearing now that the patent wars are getting to be so intricate yeah. and that obviously one vintage of innovation is the beginning of a chain, but the follow-on in the chain is impossible to do exactly. because of all the entanglements yeah. and the legal problems. So that we're, we're the, stifling innovation by g making patents too strong or too... Too strong and too broad uh, yeah. uh, is the so-called uh, uh, tragedy of the anti-commons. Right. <laughs> <laughs>